Today I'm going to talk about five riders in 500 Grand Prix racing that, in my opinion, didn't fulfil their amazing potential. I'm Neil McKenzie, a former 500 Grand Prix rider and podium finisher and three times a British Superbike champion. I'm going to talk about some of the riders I was involved with in 500 Grand Prix, a little bit about their careers and some good stuff from behind the scenes. So the first rider I'd like to talk about is Ron Haslam. Now Ron Haslam started racing five years before I even seen a racetrack. He started racing back in 1976, so he was an absolute hero of mine. Back then to think that I'd actually be racing with him in Grand Prix was just a dream. Never thought that would be possible. He was fast on the roads, a winner at Isle of Man TT, winner at Macau. He won the, the former F1 World Championship. He won British Superbike races and multiple rostrum finisher at Grand Prix. Ron is a, in some ways a very simple character, just loves motorbikes, riding, working on them. Uh, he's almost like a, an English Joey Dunlop and, and a lovely guy and at 65 years old today still as keen as ever so just an amazing person. But in the 500 Grand Prix is where I first sort of came across him in 87. I raced hard with him in 87. We were both on factory Hondas. And fortunately for me uh, during that season Ron had to switch to the Elf chassis machine which wasn't quite as capable as the factory bike he was on. Uh, beginning the season, he had two podiums in the first three rounds uh, at Hareth and also at Hockenheim, so he was well on his way and he actually finished fourth in the 1987 500cc World Championship, so really still at the top of his game, but as I said, went on to ride the Elf Machine also in 1988, which wasn't quite as competitive, uh, fortunately for me, but even then he, he was still brilliant. He then went on to ride for Pepsi Suzuki, and of course the Kajiba team, again on probably less competitive bikes, but Ron was really was at the top of his game all the way through. Why didn't he win any Grand Prix? I think he was a little bit unlucky. He came very close in Assen one year in the wet and he was just he was just, just brilliant and probably just ran out of factory support at, at the wrong time in, in the late 80s. His good points, certainly back in the push start days, was his starts. His starts were amazing. You pretty much guarantee that Ron would get the whole shot. Most Grand Prix, uh, he, was, he was absolutely brilliant there. He didn't have any weak points, except that he just loved racing bikes. Some of the other riders around him were pretty much focused on one thing, winning, maybe didn't quite enjoy it as much, but they just uh, they were just totally focused on, on winning, didn't care about anything else, and Ron was, was more of a caring person, if you like. Uh, if there's one reason that it didn't quite happen for him was that uh, he just ran out of time, but he was still, as I say, at the top of his game all the way till the end. And then he came back, uh, as we all know, to race in the British Superbike Championship and uh, had some good races with him there as well in the early 90s. But Ron, great guy and still is to this day. So a little Frenchman I got to know very well uh, throughout the 80s was named Raymond Roche. Raymond uh, burst onto the 500 Grand Prix scene in the early 80s uh, and the pinnacle of his career was actually 1984 when he finished third in the World Championship aboard the three-cylinder Rothmans Honda, French support team. Raymond was a happy chap, didn't speak much English back in the day, but he was, he was certainly friendly with all the Europeans. He did not take any stick from the super strong Americans out on track or in the paddock. He was very much focused on, on doing his thing. And as I said, third in the World Championship and, and plenty of rostrums along the way. I think his strong points were just that he was very focused. He wasn't intimidated by anyone. And, but then his weak points, I guess he just wasn't getting the factory support the likes of Freddie Spencer was getting. Uh, Wayne Gardner, maybe even Ron Haslam, and, and I think he just lacked out there. He was in a, a one-rider team just trying to make it all happen. And while the factory support was coming for other riders, it wasn't quite happening for him. He tailed off in 500 Grand Prix towards the end. He ended up signing for Kijiva. That bike definitely wasn't competitive. It didn't show Raymond's potential. 
and it, things just didn't quite work out. And as I said, he went on to to ride in the World Superbike Championship. Um, but a great little guy, great character. He's got lots of stories uh, about his Kajiba days with the Castiglione brothers who just seemed to have a, a bucket load of cash at all times. He says it wasn't so much to pay them lots of money, um, but he said the flying around in helicopters and private jets and anything you wanted in between the races was never a problem. So, so lots of good stories from Raymond, if you ever get a few, few beers down his neck. Um, I guess now he's uh, he's back in France running a distribution company for bike wear, helmets, stuff like that. But uh, a great guy and a good friend to this day. Didier Derrides, a Belgian rider, stupidly good looking, very, very fast in the 215, 350 class back in the day, podium finisher, race winners back then, and then jumped up to the 500 class. Didier was uh, initially looked like he was going to go all the way, but I feel Didier just was stuck a little bit in the old school style of riding. It worked in 250s and 350s, and at some circuits, um, the 500 class, he was okay, but he wasn't able to adapt, in my opinion, to the way the Americans and Australians could ride coming from their flat track backgrounds. I raced against Didier quite a lot and I felt like even I adapted a little bit more. I wasn't obviously quite as good as the Americans and the Australians, but Didier just got, got stuck in that rut really. Uh, again, lovely chap, great socially. He was a sponsor's dream because as I said, he, he did have the looks and being Belgium, he was perfectly positioned for all the, the big tobacco markets at the time with Marlboro and Lucky Strike. So Didier was always top of the list as far as the tobacco sponsors were concerned. He had some podium finishes. I know he finished second at the British Grand Prix in the wet one time. He was second on the Marlboro Yamaha when he was riding for Ago. Uh, but that year, I, I was also raced pretty hard with him and uh, he just seemed to be setting bikes on fire all the time. Um, if you've seen a bike in the bales and it was on fire, it tended to be uh, Didier's Marlboro Yamaha. I don't know why he was a fire starter that year. He just was. I think towards the end, Didier was still able to command good wages. Uh, he gazumped me one year at Lucky Strike Suzuki when I seemed like I was on for a, another season with the team after having a, a really good year. And then Didier came off the back of an average year and, and took my slot. But I understand that's the way it works sometimes. Uh, we remain good friends throughout and are good friends to this day. So uh, Didier is still in the paddock now, uh, I think in a managerial role. And I also see that he's a full-time artist, so a man of many talents and uh, yeah, but just far too good looking for my for my liking. I'm gonna finish with two Australians. The first one is named Kevin McGee. Kevin McGee is a happy-go-lucky incredibly talented rider, Australian rider. I first got to know Kevin when I went down to Australia in 1985 to the, to the Swan Series. I was riding in the support classes on the 250 and Kevin was on this amazing 750, TZ750 Yamaha that had been built for him and he, he, he just said it all at the time. He could jump on anything and, and ride anything. That's exactly what he did with this monster. He rode it to great success in, in the Swan Series and that got noticed. And before we knew it, he was in Japan and he was in 500 Grand Prix. His strong points were, as I said, he was so laid back, nothing really bothered him. He could jump on any bike at any circuit. A new circuit didn't phase him at all. I know the first time he he came to Assen uh, as a wild card, qualified in the front row, I think he finished 10th in that race. He also came to Harama in Spain and finished third as a wild card, and these were tracks he'd never seen before. So he had incredible potential, and that was his strong points. I think maybe he's not his downfall, and we know his career ended with injury, but um, he wasn't. As a laid-back Australian, I never got the impression that he was completely comfortable in Europe. He wasn't as laid-back as some of the others. I'm pretty sure he, he missed home and, and the family, but he, he was an incredible rider. He won in Harama in his first full season in Grand Prix, so it was amazing to take a, a 500 Grand Prix win, and there was no reason why it couldn't have gone on and on to great success. I think he finished, I know he finished fifth in the World Championship in 1988. Unfortunately, things went wrong for him after that. No fault of his own. 
he uh, there was a, an incident in Laguna Seca where he he ended up with uh, a broken leg in 1989. Then in 1990, he crashed at Laguna Seca again and had a fairly serious head injury. Um, and that's pretty much what finished his career, which was a sad. The guy had as much potential as anyone. The, the Australians were coming thick and fast at the time. Uh, and unfortunately for Kevin, he, his Grand Prix career came to an end all too abruptly. He raced after that. I actually raced with him in the 1992 Suzuki Hours, and we finished second on the Nescafe Yamaha, which was great for me. He was he was actually a stronger rider over the weekend than me, but we brought him home to second, so I was very grateful for that. And he also was back racing in the 500 Championship in Japan, where he finished runner up to Daryl Beatty. So so had a good end to his career, and then after that back to Australia to do some TV time, but. As I said, a typical happy-go-lucky, laid-back Australian and uh, just unfortunate that his, his Grand Prix career potential wasn't realised. Now last but certainly not least is another Australian called Daryl Beattie. Daryl, another great friend, spent a lot of time socially with Daryl in Europe and Australia over the years. and. If I said Kevin McGee was laid back, then Daryl Beatty was absolutely horizontal. Oozing with talent, uh, travelled well, loved going around the world. There was no problems for him being in other countries and, and doing his thing. He was nurtured by Honda in Japan in the early 90s and they sent him off to Grand Prix in 1993 under Rothman's Honda. He was an immediate success, had a really strong season in my opinion, but for some reason, uh, that contract wasn't renewed for 1994. I guess they had other riders in the pipeline. Wayne Gardner was there already established and they could see obviously massive potential in McDoing. So Darrell uh, didn't re-sign with Honda and went to the Marlboro Yamaha team of Kenny Roberts in the time. That season wasn't great, mainly due to injury, but there was, there was no question that Darrell was going to bounce back. So it turned out to be three manufacturers in three years. In 1995, he signed for Lucky Strike Suzuki. And in my opinion, uh, he was, uh, Kevin Schwantz at the time was, was struggling with injury and Daryl was the, the ideal replacement. And the only guy over the years uh, from when Suzuki returned to GPs that could actually make things happen on the RGD 500. So by the middle of the season, Daryl was leading the championship on the Lucky Strike Suzuki. Uh, Pushed hard by Mick Doohan, uh, incidentally best mates as well, and I remember at the time that they started giving each other a little bit of distance socially, which is, is normal. But uh, unfortunately in Assen, Darrell broke his collarbone and it wasn't a massive injury, he came back fairly quickly, but you don't give away points to Mick Doohan and he got the stranglehold on the championship and eventually uh, won the championship with Darrell being runner-up. It was a shame really because he was certainly on for a, a good championship battle all the way to the end of the season. Darrell remained with Lucky Strike Suzuki in 1996 and 97. Unfortunately pre-season in 96 he had a fairly big head injury in testing and it really knocked the stuffing out of him and for lots of reasons over the next two years he just didn't regain that form which was a, a massive uh, a massive loss to, to 500 Grand Prix. Um, he's perfectly healthy and fit and fine, but um, the edge was, was certainly off his competitiveness at the time. And it's a shame because Darrell was the perfect Grand Prix rider, laid back, talented, nothing was a problem. He was a good looking guy, again, a sponsor's dream and a rider that would have gone all the way, but uh, it wasn't to be. Um, but great to see he's still got a really good business going down there in Australia, doing lots of adventure stuff, and very much still on bikes and cars and trucks and all that stuff, so having a, a great life. And while we're on the subject of 500 Grand Prix, Taylor McKenzie has kindly allowed me to do a little plug. And uh, I've got these nice little watches that have become, well, ambassador is the word. They're called Motoculture. Check out the website. All the watches are themed on the 500 Grand Prix era. So uh, if you're looking for a present for your girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, uh, check out Motoculture. 
Well, thanks for listening. And if you've enjoyed this chat, why not check out some of the other videos in the series? Tell us what you think.